Hello, everybody. Um, so, like the chairman already said, I'm going to talk about targeting of uh, a receptor in, in, in the gut and uh, a reason why uh, vaccinating the gut, uh, vaccinating against enteric infections is, is important. Uh, you see here, uh, you see that in, in humans, uh, few vaccines exist against, uh, um, against enteropathogens. So there is still need to improvement. And it's also interesting to note that of the vaccines that exist, uh, most, most are live attenuated vaccines. There are only few dead vaccines available. This is the situation in pigs. There are some vaccines on the market. In, in our country, this is only the attenuated Lausonia vaccine. And the, this one is in Europe on the market, but not yet in Belgium. And these ones, I think, are in the United States and Canada, but not in Europe on the market. And that's, re that's because they do not uh, work perfectly. Um, also, this one has protective effects, but it's not completely protecting, and the same is true for the Lausonia vaccine. So, nevertheless, there are a lot of enteropathogens in the pig. Enteropathogens that are zoonotic, uh, it's, a, it's a long list, and there are enteropathogens that are quite similar to human pathogens. And, and we in the, in the lab work on the enterotoxigenic E. coli viruses. So oral vaccination remains very difficult. And why is this the case? You know, a lot of the experimental death vaccines, they try to target the immune uh, induction sites at the end of the small intestine, the Peyer's patches, the M cells in the Peyer's patches, and, and hope to induce uh, protective immunity here. But uh, one of the problems is that in larger species, not in mice, in mice the in small intestine is, is about 30 to 50 centimeter long, but in a pick of 10 days, it's eight and a half meter long. And in a human, it's seven to eight meter long. This means that if you give a mice some such particles and they mostly give huge amounts, it reaches this pair of patches. But in, in, in pigs and in humans, it takes a lot of time. You need hours, sometimes days, to reach the caudal part of the small intestine. And meanwhile, a lot can happen. Uh, meanwhile, you have the peristaltis, you have the mucus layers, you have the bile, everything is interfering. And so it's very hard to reach these sites. Furthermore, they are limited in number. So you really have to reach them. And one of the things we're working on is to use soluble antigens. It's a little bit like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, one of the previous speakers trying to vaccinate with soluble antigen, but not by targeting these sites, but, but, but I trying to pass the enterocyte layer in the cranial part of the gut. And uh, uh, pathogens, they do, of course, both. They are mostly particles. They replicate, colonize, and so they reach the caudal parts of the small intestine. And there they pass the barrier, uh, are taken up, and pass and stimulate, activate the mucosal immune system. Or they release virulence factors, toxins, fimbria, flagellins, and they also activate the immune system in the cranial part. So it, it is feasible to do that. Uh, and, and important is, of course, that they reach the antigen-presenting cells that are lo located under the enterocyte layer, that are the dendritic cells. Um, and in case you pass the enterocytes, you need to target also in dendritic cells, but the immune response has to occur in the mesenteric lymph nodes and will not occur in Peyer's patches. So this is different. And if you attenuate your life vaccine, sometimes replication is not enough to reach, to colonize the caudal part of the small intestine, and they don't work well enough, or they don't release enough virulence factors to activate the, the immune system in the cranial parts of the gut. So that is very important. And there is research going on that understands that the, giving the particles orally is 
often not sufficient, so you need to target them in one or another way, target them to the M cells, and there are a number of receptors known, but mostly in mice, not in humans, and not in pigs. Uh, you, know, you know the, the, the common receptors. Uh, in, in mice, it's, it has been demonstrated that there is an IgA receptor. The receptor for real virus has been uh, demonstrated. And in, in humans, UEA1 receptor doesn't exist. Neither it does in pigs or sheep or so many other species. So we, I mentioned we work on enterotoxigenic and verotoxigenic E. coli in the pig system. And, and these bacteria, they have two virulence factors. The fimbria, which are important for colonizing. And these can be F4 fimbria in and F18 fimbria. And then after colonization, they release toxins. The LT toxin is well known as a very good mucosal adjuvant. So one of the reasons why these bacteria are very uh, potent stimulators of the immune system. And then you have the, the smaller toxins. And then you have the virotoxins, which are produced only by the F18 positive strains. So we work on the lab on these fimbria and we purified F4 fimbria. And if you purify them and give one milligram a few days after another to the piglets, and you look at the immune response, and this is F4 specific antibody secreting cells in the blood, different days after immunization, then you can see after one immunization a nice immune response, a little bit like it was seen in the young newborns. So you pick up the cells. And you see from day nine on, there is a small IgA response, a number of IgA antibody secreting cells appearing in, in the blood. And if you then look locally in the lymphoid tissues at 11 days post-infection, you see IgA antibody secreting cells in the Peyer's patches, mesenteric lymph nodes, lamina propria, and spleen. So not huge amounts, but they're there. So it is possible with these fimbria to pass the gut. And we did many, many experiments in the lab. We know they pass the gut, they reach the immune system in the gut, and they uh, activate mesenteric lymph nodes. They also reach the spleen. They easily go to the, pass the barrier to the systemic immune system and induce systemic immunity also. And we demonstrated that these fimbria, if you incubate them with the enterocytes, they're taken up, they're endocytosed very quickly. And you see this, this is stained with cytokeratin 18. This is staining the border of the, the, this is a villus, and here you have the enterocytes. And the, the border is stained, and the, the fimbria are taken up very quickly. After five minutes, you see them already in the enterocytes. 15 minutes, all the cell is filled up. And they do not only bind to enterocytes. If you look at pair patches, cytokeratin 18 is a marker for M cells. So you see here the M cells on, uh, in the dome epithelium above the pear's patch. You see it also binds to the M cells. So it binds to something that is present on enterocytes and on M cells. And if you wait a little bit longer, you see the antigen appearing in SIRP-alpha positive cells. SIRP-alpha is CD172A, if you know what it means. But it's a marker for antigen-presenting cells. So it appears in antigen-presenting cells. So we were interested to know what is this recognizing. And we tried to look in the brush border to the proteins did 2D gels and incubated them with the fimbria, which is working very nicely. And in pigs, you also have receptor negative animals, which do not have the receptor. So you can, the same, you can do the same with the receptor negative ones, and you can pick up the, the proteins that are recognizing the fimbria. And this, one of these proteins was aminopeptidase N. And aminopeptidase N is a very interesting protein. It's a, a homodimer, which is, of course, involved in, in uh, cutting uh, peptides and is present in the brush border. But it's also present on immune cells. It's CD13. 
It's present on antigen-presenting cells. And not only that, it's also a receptor for a lot of pathogens. It's the receptor for TGE virus, a coronavirus in pigs. It's a receptor for human uh, um, respiratory coronaviruses. It's a receptor for coronaviruses in cats and dogs, for human cytomegalovirus. And what we, I worked long ago on coronavirus in the pig, and we knew that the coronavirus, if you infect pigs, it's really inducing huge IgA responses, tremendous, strong activation of the IgA system. So this was very interesting. So we produced polyclonal antibodies against this molecule. And this is a control with rabbit IgG that is not binding to aminopeptidase N, and this is binding to aminopeptidase N. And if you incubate it, it rapidly binds to the brush border. And after 15 minutes, after five minutes, 15 minutes, it is there in the anthracytes. So it's rapidly taken up, just like the fimbria. So that was uh, interesting. And if you do then an immunization experiment with these polyclonal antibodies, and we give the same amount as with the fimbria, here at day zero, one, and two, and we boost three weeks later. We did it with and without cholera toxin. Uh, you get this type of response. This is, this are the, antibodies that are not targeting APN, this is without cholera toxin, and these are the antibodies targeting APN. And you see, so after one immunization, seven days later, you see important concentrations of IgA in the serum of the piglets. So this is really strong, a strong response, because I can tell you, inducing IgA in the gut is not an easy thing. So this is a strong response. And we also looked locally in the intestine and different tissues. This is only the result of the lamina propria. And here you have the group without cholera toxin and the control IgG, the with cholera toxin, the control IgG, with anti-APN without cholera toxin, and with anti-APN with cholera toxin. This is after a boost, seven days and nine days, and you see that without cholera toxin, and after nine days after the boost, boost you get a, a very good IgA response in the, uh, in the uh, mucosa. So this is IgA appearing. So this is very interesting, but with polyclonal antibodies, you cannot immunize. This is not a good target molecule. So we, meanwhile, already developed monoclonals against APN, and we have the epec 2 cell line, which, which most of people who work with PICs know this cell line. It's an enterocyte cell line, and we transfected it because it's weakly expressing APN, very weakly. So we transfected it with APN. And if you then incubate it with the antibodies, they, you see them binding and be taken up by the enterocyte cell line. Um, okay, so this is further in development. We are in a phase of conjugating it with, uh, with uh, antigens. And we will conjugate it first with an antigen of ETEC strains, FETF, the adesin of the virotoxigenic E. coli. And use this to target uh, through the enterocytes. But we are also working on trying to see what it's doing when you use particles and coat them with these antibodies. We know if you incubate them with the dendritic cells, they also have this receptor and they are taken up much efficient, more efficient than when you don't add the antibodies on the particles. But here, of course, the passage through the barrier will be the limitate, limitating step. So this was my talk. This is a result of a work of a lot of people uh, who are involved during many years. And it's financially supported on all kind of levels. Uh, the, this, the fundamental research of Flanders, this more uh, industrial research fund the university, and this is the health, uh, uh, the, the federal health department in Belgium that is supporting this. Thank you very much.